Damn Podcast, everybody. Season two. You know why you're here. I'm Christian Gordon, band director at Westlake's Middle School in Parkland, Florida. And I'm Andrew Lopez, the band director at Coniston Middle School in West Palm Beach. And joining us today on the computers is AJ Garcia. Hey guys. Hey, JRC, I'm the band director over at Coral Springs Middle School in we, Coral Springs, Florida. We're new and improved. We have a guy in the chair. He's guy literally in the chair. He's the guy in the chair to pull up the things, to tell us to do the thing. Jamie to the Joe Rogans. Jamie to the Joe. Is it Jamie? Yeah. It's Jamie. Okay. <laughs> but we're not bald. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> not- <laughs> yeah. Better than Alex Jones. We're also not on Roids. <laughs> no, and we're also not Alex Jones, so. <clears throat> Sorry, part of Not, not Roids, TRT. Don't. <laughs> Let's not Tell get into stem cells. Stop. Stem cells. Stop. Freaking. You know, I sent you an Alex Jones thing last night. I oh, I saw it. Did you it, watch it? Yeah, all the coughing. It was awesome. <laughs> the dude was wheezing. And I love Roy trial. Jr. He, he's a f- super funny comedian. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Anyway, so, today we're here to talk about warm ups and. Uh, how do we cover components of playing through our warm-ups? Not just what we do in our own band rooms, but what we've seen other people do, just to give everyone a good overview, things to use, a nice toolbox to use going into the new school year. Quick disclaimer, this is not a check out my cool warm-up sequence sponsored by Check This Out, and you can totally buy it. It's not like we're not selling anything other than bad, right. other than bad jokes and anything. <laughs> terrible, terrible jokes. Anything Joe Rogan might want to let us, you know, let us sell. Also, uh, I'm in. I'm now in the shop for a new makeup chair for my wife's vanity. Because uh, I don't know. I don't know if Kaylin's going to include it or not. But I, there, there's definitely a recording of me falling out of the chair. Yeah. So I'm, if anybody knows where I'd get a good makeup vanity, that that'd be great. But yeah, so we're we're not really selling anything. We're not selling. We're not trying to promote what we do. We're just having a conversation on different ways to cover different fundamental concepts. Um, in no particular order, um, but you know, and, and also just kind of giving our take on it as we always do. So AJ, what's yep, first? Yep. What's first, Tommy? We got the big well, T. Well, Tom. Whoa. Okay. Well, first, let's talk about the big B. TRT <laughs> or big B? <laughs> yeah, breathing. Yeah. Because we left that off the list. We did. So I'll, I'll go ahead and start because the way we do breathing is extremely simple. And yeah. stolen from Alex Kaminsky, mm-hmm. and I know he shared it all around. But we do um, first, we do breathing tubes, which is just a half inch diameter PVC pipe. You can pick up packs of them at Home Depot or Lowe's. We ask the kids to put the tube in between their teeth, and then seal their lips around the tube. They stand up, make sure they have enough room to slightly open their arms in and out as they breathe in and out. We do in for four, out for four twice, in for three, out for four twice, in for two, out for four twice, in for one, out for four twice. Uh, Encouraging the students to increase the amount of air that they take in every time they inhale and make sure they're completely empty on every exhale, especially as the the duration of the inhale shortens, we still want them to take in lots of air. So that's the first step, takes 60 seconds. Second step is we use 12 inch diameter balloons and uh, with that, we do we try to do it as uniform as possible. So left hand on the balloon, right hand on the stomach. When we call them to set, they assume that position, and they breathe in for two, and they breathe and they inflate the balloon for twelve, and we do that a couple times. Sometimes we get fancy with it and put the balloon on the end of the brass mouthpieces, and do breathing like that. Uh, both exercises we do at quarter note equals 96. All in all, the breathing takes about three to five minutes. So that's what we do at Westlades. Copy and paste, baby. I wasn't listening. Sorry. Do you stand up? Dang, dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I said we have them stand up. Yeah, and okay. And they move their arms for the, yeah. for the breathing tube part. Yeah, so we I don't have them move their arms. I, I That's not a bad idea. I But we stand up, have them do the, the same tube, um, you know, making sure that... <clears throat> they're they're not putting it in between their lips, but in between their teeth. Uh, I make the joke. I need to see that uvula. Um, 
Because <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like I want to, as I tell him, be careful. Either and then, well, sometimes after lunch, I'll be like, I need to see, like, I want to see what you had for lunch because your oh my god, because the idea is your mouth should be open. <laughs> so I want to see that your mouth is open. I want to see that there there's air moving through, and I also talk about the cool air in the back of the throat, like just the chill, so mm-hmm. that way you know it's open and you know it's relaxed. Um, and then with balloons, I I, I try to stress um, the, the twelve inch. But you know, I'll take honestly. I'll take whatever I can get. Honestly, I tell the kids not not the long ones because like that's not useful or helpful. Um, but then you know, ha- and same things, making sure your hands on the stomach, making sure it's in for two. I do, and I I reference inside the circle concepts like you know using twelve count air, four count air, two count air to reference how hard you're blowing and how how much air you should be blowing at one time. Because then you can also use that. That transfers into my long tone concepts. Um, so I referenced all those that we, we run through 12, 10, 8, 6, 4, 2 every day. And then that's it. If we're, if we're, if we're feeling daring, if we have, like, if we have time, um, we'll do one and you'll have the kids go, <laughs> and right. <laughs> just, just to get it out. Um, but then also referencing, huh. yeah. And then also at the very end, you know, probably either we'll, two or three times we'll have up, you know, we'll put the, the brass mouthpieces on the balloons as well and also the neck and uh, barrel for the clarinets and saxes and I tell the flutes to just deal with it um, you put the balloon on a on a clarinet barrel yeah yeah that's fine works out fine <clears throat> um cause it gets, I've seen kids try to do that they they like rip like they don't fit properly never happened if it does, if it if it does, it's typically they they're also holding on to it, so there's a partial seal, but it works out fine. They would need um, a larger balloon for that too. Like I like I said, I get varied sizes. Um, typically not varied types of balloons, but I do get varied sizes. Mm. Um, Is and there then, a process that you tell the clarinets to do, like when they put it over the barrel, or do you just literally just don't even mention just, it? Sometimes, yeah. At the beginning, I have them do it over the mouthpiece because the cork is smaller. Um, like the opening of the the aperture of the, mm. of the mouthpiece is smaller, so you can do that. It's just how loud do you want your ears to ring? Um, <laughs> cause you've got, you've got that. Um, but yeah, no, it works out fine. And then, uh, same thing, same sequence. It, t- it takes, I've, it's never taken five, but you know, maybe I think three minutes is a good estimate. Um, and I typically wait uh, to do breathing. You said, you, I know you've mentioned you do it like right away. I t- one. I typically wait to do breathing until after I've gotten the kits in their hands. So that way they can, it's just, it, for me, it's just the logic of like, I can imagine me being Andrew, sixth grader, and going, I don't want to do super breathing if I don't see the point to it, even if it's explained to me. So I'm like, oh, right, air, got it, blow, should, I can, okay. And then it makes it happen. But I, so for me, it's usually like day four or day five that we usually hit it. But yeah, so that's breathing. Is there, are there any, what are your buzzwords? Like when you're, when you're speaking to kids and you're running through the routine as, as they're going through their, their sequence, well, like just something you would shout out just as a reminder. Um, first thing that comes to mind is when we're using the balloon, I'll say aim your air at the back of the balloon. Hmm. Um, another thing is I tell them like, if you're getting a little lightheaded or if you're, um, feeling a little uncomfortable in the chest or breathing cavity area, that's a good thing. Yep. Um, as long as you're doing it properly. Yeah, no, same. And it's like, a telling them it's like it's i like yeah i do the same thing where i'm just like you know if you're not lightheaded you're doing it wrong mm-hmm. because other because it's just it's just a muscle or so. like if you have to yawn you yeah know, it should make you have to yawn mm-hmm. um we put the hand on the stomach so that kids can feel the expansion and they should aim their their inhale all the way down to where their hand is so hand on stomach i usually say right on the belly button so everyone puts it in the same <laughs> And relatively the same place. Mm-hmm. Uh, other buzzwords. Um, That's pretty much it for me. Uh, that for me and just open, open mouth, open mouth, right. o- open mouth, cool air, cool air down the throat. Because that's that's how that's just the best way to get them relaxed. But other than that, pretty much it for me. What about students who will insist on puffing their cheeks to blow through the balloon, or say, "I've never blown up a balloon before." Yeah. So to because that happened so many times. Yeah, I had a girl like that this year. She's like, I didn't know how. And I said, I was like, I told her fun, fun story. I didn't know how to blow up a balloon until three years ago. 
Oh. So I tell her that. I'm like, I didn't, I've, like, I've always been self-conscious about it, because all my friends were like, it was a balloon, and I'm just sitting there like that nerd in the corner, just, <laughs> um, I didn't know how. So, but I tell her, I literally, I can reference that story and be like, you just, it's, it's trial and error, and make sure that you're, you know, sealing your, I tell them about the seal around the lip of the balloon, so that way the lip of the balloon, because that's, that, it catches on your teeth, and then you close your mouth around it, and voila. And just, you know, two months later, she was blowing it up, and I made fun of her in front of everybody. I was like, hey, you can do it. You did a great. And she, she got soup. You got as red as the balloon. And that's the last time I did that. But, um, yeah, I trial and error. Just teach them how. <clears throat> well, I think that might be a benefit for giving it to them as soon as possible so they can practice that. Because mm-hmm. you want them to be very aware of how they're using their muscles that they use for breathing for when they're using the kits and when they're uh, playing their instrument. Yeah, and it's also like it to be second nature. Yeah, and it's also in terms of the puffing the cheeks. At some point, you can eventually, you know, to your vets right away at the beginning of the year, you can say assume the embouchure. But to your beginners, you know, as they learn what an embouchure is, assume your embouchure, and you should be you should be doing it with an embouchure <coughs> of some kind, which automatically assumes if you're stressing, no no cheeks, no cheeks. All right, I mean, is there anything else that you do? Um, or there anything else that we want to recommend other than the strategies that we use? Because what we use works great for middle school. It also works great for high school, depending on how you can sell that buy-in. But not everybody, not not every band director is comfortable with the gimmick. So what are other things you've seen? Yeah. Or it's just a matter of what you're familiar with. Right. So what one thing I've seen right off the bat is before, like, um, paper. You know, the yeah, paper air is great. Yep. Getting the strategy. I'll do that sometimes. Yeah. Um, Sometimes we'll do, like, especially if I have just brass, we'll do air through the brass instrument. So I have them wrap their, well, at least the smaller mouthpieces, I'll have them wrap their lips around the mouthpiece Mm -hmm. or spread their lips really wide and just do inhale, exhale through the instrument, um, valves open, valves down, different pressure to get them to understand, like, uh, the different amount of air pressure needed for you know, different valve combinations. For trombone, a cool one is you can do is have them start breathing in seventh and then bring the slide in because they'll feel, they'll feel the pressure change mm, and back and forth. That's cool. Another one that I've seen is people taking like the, you blow the paper against the wall. Yeah. So you can, so it's about air speed that's and air, tough. And air yeah. pressure. It's, I, really it's tough, tough, but like people, kids can do it. Um, I knew one band director that that was part of his fitting for flute because it was like, if you're trying to, you know, you're standing up and then the air is your air, if your air is pointing down like me because you have buck teeth, you know, where, where is the paper mm. on the wall? If mm. the paper's straight ahead, that's the airstream. And so, and you know, like that. Um, and then obviously talking about breathing gym, you know, for, for yeah. marching bands and, you know. So I, who, I've done breathing gym. Yep. You've done breathing gym? Oh yeah. And AJ's done breathing gym. Marissa's, Marissa's band lives on it religiously. It's, it's uh, we love it. It's a good approach. It's a solid, tried and true approach. Bill did it with uh, Omni when he was there. Like just the regular stock breathing gym, mm-hmm. and I do a lot of that stuff at the beginning. At the beginning with the advanced bands too, just like at the beginning of the year, getting them warmed up. In addition to the balloon routine, um, I don't I don't do it too often, but I've seen it done. So we just do we do tube and balloon without fail every day. Um, I in the past I, I knew some people that would get on YouTube. Jamie pulled it up. Oh, sorry, Adrian. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, there are free videos on, on YouTube now. Uh, Kaylin did this um, back in Lee County. She, uh, Lee County, Georgia. She would just turn on the video. video and the kids would start as she's still getting ready for class. Mendez did that too. Like that's a, that's a, that's a common practice I've seen for a lot of people. Because that one then yeah. Palafian and Sheridan, the, the video is designed that way. Yeah. Is like is if the kids you know if if you have if you've got that good behavior and you have that good management and oversight, right. the kids will just do it and fall in line. It's really fun. I, I you know I think um, yeah, it's really engaging and it and it opens kids up to to other um, ways of accessing more air and using more air. Yeah, I, we could talk about breathing forever, but I have one question: What's your favorite breathing gym exercise? Mm. I got one. Man, okay. So there's 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 the one where you breathe in and then you sip sip mm-hmm. and then you let it out. I like that one, but I also like the one where you like suck the back of the pop. hand. Yep. Oh, the and then pop. you do the pop. Yeah. And taking lots of air and, and the the leak. Yeah, yeah. But I also like the one with the hand. My favorite. You hear that one? Yeah. Like there's so many. E's to O's, baby. The yeah. <laughs> oh, I hated that. I, I hated love because well because I when I whenever I do it um. 
I always it did not make sense to me. Whenever I sold, because it's it, it's all about opening, and whenever I sold it to the kids, um, I would have them do it in the stance of like a of a of a gorilla, <laughs> and at the end you'd go, oh, 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 and just getting that that warm. I, I oh, I do it. like paper airplane, bow and arrow, and I do javelin. What's the I, other one? I do. I, I kind of cho- I changed it to be my own a little bit. Oh, I darts. Love, yeah, paper airplane, those, dart, and javelin. Those visualizations. I think they resonate so much with the kids. They can see it happening. Mm -hmm. So the one that I use, I start off, I go incremental towards like least intense to most intense amount of, you know, velocity of air. And so I start off with uh, a baseball. And so I say you're in outfield trying to throw all the way to second base or even to home plate. You wind up and you just let it go. Mm -hmm. Follow your throw. And it's a really relaxed amount of air. The second one I do is a paper airplane. You know, follow it all the way through until it drops. And then the last one is obviously we have a dart. That just kind of we get aggressive, man. Intense. We do paper airplane dart, and I talk about javelin mm-hmm. track and field. With that I want, and I told him like, I want sphere. you, to, I want you to get it right in my face. Like, shut up, Mister Lopez. Here mm-hmm. we come, and the kids are like, ah, because yeah, you know, but it's like, yeah. but yeah. yeah. All right, so let's um, we um, we we'll move on to tone from here. We got we got a long list, yeah. so we got to keep moving. We okay. could, I mean, breathing is like the number one, which is why we wanted to spend a lot of time on it. But we got, we got to. I would say at least in. just do like a minute of deep breathing with your band. Something. The do idea, because like Alfred Watkins was the whole thing that uh, I've heard him talk about it before. Is that you know when you explain it to kids, the breathing you do in band is is different from the breathing you do every day. So as long as you do something different breathing wise to warm up the day, they are not their lungs are now set for you. Boom. That, that's all it needs to be. What else we got? Tone. Breathe da, baby. Thank you, Larry Shane. Breathe da. Breathe da. No cracking. Nope. He stop knows. Cracking. Yep. Hashtag stop cracking. Yep. Stop cracking. Breathe da. I mean, it's I mean da, and then vowel. It's all about vowel shape and warm air and a thousand buzzwords. I don't really go through a process of teaching it other than just stressing those things over and over every day, all the time. What about <clears throat> instrumental videos that you can show the kids? That on a, too. On a weekly basis, I used to, when I was doing my internship, we used to have a video, like genre that we would put up on a weekly basis. So like per week, we would have videos on like a separate instrument. Mm-hmm. So like for that entire week, when they were when the kids were coming in, they were hearing you know good bassoon sounds or good trumpet sounds or good whatever the instrument was that week. Mm-hmm. Especially when they're walking in, you mm-hmm. know, when they're getting their instruments together, they have that two minute process or however long you may allot. They're hearing that happen, especially the kids that play that instrument. They're coming in and they're hearing their instrument. You know, they can pretty much pick it up. It happens. I think it was more effective towards after you guys did the fitting and after we did the fitting so that they could hear their instrument a few times themselves, especially when you bring in, you know, the specialists that come in and they work with them. But that's, that's, I think, listening to musicians that are, you know, on their instrument play at really high levels where it's it could just be you know, like really easy music or really you know difficult music i think it's as that, long a, as they're listening. that subconscious exposure i think is what it lends itself to i mean it's you can you can you can have them exposed to that kind of stuff and ha- and obviously you know getting that good sound of their ear modeling is another good way to show good tone if you're good at if you are good at it which i'm not on flute <clears throat> um but yeah i mean i i typically just try to Aside from the modeling and showing them where the good sounds come from, the words that I say is breathe, da, open mouth, open your teeth, you know. And when you when you're hearing good tones in the classroom, backing it up and saying, yeah, do that, match, and then do blending exercises, which we'll get into later. But mm-hmm. I think I think the tone, I don't have any go to things for tone. It's just it's something it's it, it's like it's you, you chisel away at it all year long, mm-hmm. and then you know and get it does it's not that doesn't mean it's bad for us. A certain amount of time, it's just constant adjustments and constant attention. Usually lends itself to a good sound. What about you? Uh, yeah, tone is just a never-ending quest. It's just something that's always going to be improving. Yep. Um, you know, along with everything, but tone is is a tough one because it's really easy to get complacent with how you sound individually or how your band sounds. Um, I think my main uh, method of teaching tone is 
always, whenever we go around the band, is always finding the kidney section that has the best sound and getting the rest to sound like them. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, kids will strive for that and then eventually maybe surpass that. And then they're the kids that, they're the kid that I have everyone else match. So on and so forth. So we yeah. improve tone that way. Obviously having professionals come in. South Florida, a lot of clinicians around here. So we're able to bring in a lot of people yep. and bring them in often. And so having clinicians in that can model great sounds is 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 good as well. That's probably our other pillar for teaching tone. Yeah. Did I talk? I've, I've talked to you about it before. Listening cards. You may that, have. That's something. Because like, so what I used, and I got this from a friend of mine, uh, Tara Melvin, um, when she was in Florida. Now she's in Georgia. Uh, but she. She would have the kids, basically, It's that was their exposure to listening, was they would listen, and they would have to write, you know, certain, con- like, they would have to hear any anything that they heard that reminded them of concepts we speak about in class, they had to write it down, and it could be a max of, like, five things, um, and then just general, con- like, comments on the on the video or audio that they listened to that they liked, and that was, and for me, that was, that worked twofold, one, getting them to listen to professionals, in addition to playing recordings in class and bringing in people and also modeling ourselves, but also getting them, I can look at the trumpet section and be like, you guys need to sound like Hans Gonch. And that every kid goes, Oh yeah, I know who that is. As opposed to the, the usual, you know, (laughs) just like dead silence that you get. Um, Mm -hmm. so that's, that's the, that's another way to do, to talk about tone. In addition to your right, it really is just a never ending quest. And it's important for band directors to record their bands so you can hear it because how you hear it in real time you may think that there's overtones but there may not be overtones and you, that recording I think really helps in the, in the long term process mm-hmm. of shaping I, so. I think that's really good yeah I think the, the topic of the listening cards you know that's that's great I loved it the kids love it and you know there's a clinician that comes in and works with you know our low brass and he works at another high school but he always tells his students who is your favorite musician that plays your instrument? Yep. And if you cannot come up with an answer within the first five seconds, you know, if you're just sorting it in your head if you have too many, or if you can't think of it at the top of your head, he says, you need to go to YouTube right now and just watch. Spend an hour or two just listening to people that play your instrument. A rabbit hole. You know, and, and it he's... He said time and time again that it has proven to be an amazing tool that we have. You know, just YouTube in itself is awesome. Spotify, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. If they if they have that at their fingertips every day, you know, they're on their phones constantly. They should be listening to, you know, really awesome artists that are just putting out music all the time. Not even just playing their, you know, original music, but like, you know, just standards or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So that way they can at least have an idea of, oh, this is sounds good they can listen to it and try to mimic it you know that was one thing that when i was going through and you know especially trying to improve my tone on my own instrument that was just so valuable to my growth i agree what's next um i was gonna say about tone um playing sustains long tones yeah. sustains unison or chords or otherwise remington's um, yeah but even with, with Remington, I'm, yes, good, F- but F- my, F- my F- idea, R- yeah, my idea with sustains is, is literally, literally having them build a wall of sound for as long as possible. Yep. You know what's um, super cool? I just pulled this up on YouTube. Lo-fi long tones. Warm up long tone chromatics. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but no, still, stuff like that's really cool. Like, these sure. kids don't want to just listen to, you know, it's cool to listen to a metronome, all, you know, it, we want them to listen to a metronome, but if they can play along to something like this where it's literally just focused, I haven't listened to it, but it looks pretty cool. It's two minutes. I have the, um, I'm of the mindset, I, 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 I tell the kids, long tones are not fun. Get over it. It'll make you better. Oh. And like, I just, I tell, like, because I'm like, I'm not going to sit here. I think that's cool, um, but I always tell because I'm like because it's and I, I used to do stuff like that, but for me I can't hear it, I can't hear them, or like I can't hear what I want to hear. Um, so I would always tell the kids like long tones are not fun, but they are what you ordered because if you if you ordered playing your instrument, this is if you ordered the ability to play your instrument, well, this is what you paid for. Playing so, well, yeah, like yeah, but the, you know what I mean. Like this is if, if bands a steak dinner, long tone is the meat. Long tones, the pro- long tones of the protein. So suck it up, concert F. 
And we, and <laughs> we do interpret that into our technique builders and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. You know, that's that's one of the first, I think it's one of the first two exercises that we do, first three exercises in each technique builder. Mm -hmm. Well, here in this room, we all use technique builders. I'm moving to Bill's things, but I know what they are and can help with the discussion. <laughs> okay. I'm, just, I'm trying out Bill's stuff. Okay. See how it goes. Okay, so AJ and I use uh, technique builders that we adapted from Andy Poor's technique builders. Mm -hmm. In them are long tone exercises, literally, you know, four beats per note, then on the next one, eight beats per note, and then eventually 12. 12. Yeah. Um, and we work up to 12 beats per note because that's what our breathing exercise does with the balloon. We, trans we try to go straight from using the balloon to playing the long tones to transfer that knowledge. It's good scaffolding. Um, so those are the long tone exercises we do. We also, you know, through uh, tuning the band, do but work on tone as well. Mm -hmm. We emphasize tone that way. So what's in uh, Bill's, like what? What long tones does he have his kids doing? So there's, you know, he's got Remington's in there. And for him, long tones, and I can't believe we hadn't mentioned this yet, singing. Mm -hmm. So his is a lot of, you know, you can, when you're getting the kids warmed up to singing, have them hum it first. And you just, you can just hum, hum the note. And his is, it's it's a lot of, like, it's similar to ICT, ITC, where there's a lot of da, and then play it. And then at different intervals. Always on a concert F. So it's kind of like a Remington, but yes and no. Um, mm -hmm. Basic Remingtons. All of his long tone exercises, whether it's on his sound builders or his preparatory warm ups, which are his beginner warm ups, or his or his warm up set, um, is some sort of sing then play the long tone because that takes singing takes care of the tuning, and we'll come back to that in, in a little bit. But like, so there's a lot of singing. Um, with Marissa, she does a lot of singing. Um, so moving to bills will be good for vertical alignment. Not that the kids were apprehensive this year into like a band camp. The freshmen weren't, weren't apprehensive because we do a little bit of singing already. So they, they didn't mind having to open up and suddenly present the way we expect singers to do so in the band. Mm -hmm. But with bills having it incorporated, that'll be an easy transition. Just having them hum it. And then once they get comfortable humming, it, just open your mouth. And that's typically how I, how, how, when we train them to sing, we get them humming and we teach them how to do the tall vowel and then we don't say okay now sing it we say open your mouth and this is that jedi mind trick of before you say say it before they can think about it because you're already in the warm-up and then it just comes out um but that's that's his biggest thing of it is there's no there's no there's no length of time in which they're playing the long note it's just about making sure that they're opening up and present and how you sing it is how you play it and vice versa and giving the same feedback to both both ver both versions of performance so that way you have that nice big open sound mm -hmm. um yeah it's and the cool thing about his warm-ups is that so he's got his preparatory warm-ups and then his warm-ups and sound builders his warm-up is that he has he has four different types of warm-ups where it's the same concepts in different time signatures so he'll have like imagine imagine technique builder three is in four four time and then you rewrite Technique Builder 3 to be in 3-4 time. And, and then 5-4 time. And then 6-8 time. And so you've got, and so depending on what you're doing, you can, you're covering the same concepts. It's the same notes in the same range, but different time signatures. Hmm. And it's the same with the sound builders, where his sound builders are just building on advanced techniques in terms of range, dexterity, blah, 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 gobbledygook. So, um, and by the way, shameless plug, his are available for sale. He just published them. Um, I got to figure out if I can, maybe in the description we can figure out, I can at least send them to the site where they can buy it, but he just published them. Um, and they're, they're very popular in, in St. Lucie and they're super popular in Palm Beach. A lot of people like to use his stuff. So, and, but yeah, it works out really well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's what I got for tone singing. Oh, the other thing I wanted to bring up was, uh, and it kind of ties into singing cause you said using, uh, singing to open up. I guess their oral cavity mm -hmm. and, and their throat as well. The great thing about the breathing tube is it, it's, it's half inch for a reason. It teaches them to open the jaw when they breathe. Yep. And it's also around the same size as the trachea. So it forces them to, to get used to taking in uh, the right amount of air with the right openness and then maintaining that as well as they exhale. And you mentioned a really good scaffolding. You know what I tell the kids to do? <clears throat> Use your breathing tube embouchure. 
Because, mm-hmm. ooh, and then you can their mouth is open and sound's coming out. Um, I typically don't get to that until it's time to sing and they're ready and, you know, prepared for it. But yeah, so that's, that's what I got. Is there any, are there any other concepts to shaping tone, aside from listening, singing, you know, depth of air, um, anything we haven't mentioned yet? Maybe, maybe we don't do um, it, but we know about it. Just, uh, I would say like long tones don't have to be complicated. They also don't have to be boring. Yeah. They don't have to be boring as long as your teaching is compelling. I'm and boring. <laughs> they, well, they understand and agree to the purpose and they see progression. Um, agree. If you give them a goal for their tone, not just individually, but as a band. And when, whenever you record them, let them listen to. Yep. And they can kind of gauge on how they sound and um, the progress that they're making. I'll just say one more thing about singing. Uh, I, I trick the kids into singing too by note naming and yeah. so when they're saying the note names and I'm playing on the harmony director they, yeah. they just naturally yeah. gravitate toward matching the pitch that they hear mm-hmm. and boom they're singing and they don't know it and then when I tell them they're singing they don't care so yep that's a big one so is great. literacy on that list uh, no we, we gotta can add, we can add it we gotta add so, uh, put it somewhere because literacy See, cause is big it's, it's components of playing um, but literacy is a part of it, in my opinion. Because I, yeah. for me, it's not if it's not as much components in playing as just the fundamental concepts. And that's you know I, I think it was Alex Kaminsky that maybe if, I think I might have heard that metaphor like the steak dinner one from. Yeah, his was the uh, fundamentals are the main course. Like yeah. students think the music is the main course, but the fundamentals are the main course. And I tell them what you know. What are you looking forward to in a meal? You look forward. You look forward to the Brussels sprouts, or you look forward to the cake. And they say the cake. The cake is the music, but you can't have all cake because then you get diabetes, and that's not good. So if I can finish <laughs> what I was saying, <laughs> Kaminsky says the main course is the fundamentals, and the uh, music is the sweet dessert that you look forward to yeah. at the end of of the meal. Diabetes. <clears throat> can't you can't have just cake because then you're gonna get diabetes. You're gonna get the beaties. And you get them up. Oh. Right, AJ? Beaties <laughs> beaties <laughs> what? Don't drink. Don't. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> arms, bro. Don't. But yeah, so um No, I yeah. And I mean like we're oh, yeah, the uh, the lo fi long tones you found on YouTube. I think those are cool. Like if you you know it's neat. depending on your situation or the type of kid you're teaching and whether individually or collectively there's a lot of like cinematic. There's cinematic long tones. I think it's John McAllister. Those mm-hmm. sound amazing. Uh, they're really cool. Yeah, lo-fi long tones. If you could even just put on a, ho- a hip hop beat on you your know. computer. Yeah, you could do long tones to beats. You know, things like that. I think it's good as if a, you really want to. I think it's good as a treat. You know, yeah, it's like a yeah. Little, I like, wouldn't do it every day though. Yeah, not every day because then it's gonna get old. You know, they can. Look, give it to some, give it to them after they've you know established that concept of okay this is how we do long tones. A fun this game you can, can play too. More fun. Sorry, a fun game you can play too, and I do this with um, the beginners as they get older through the year. I do it with the veterans right away just to make the fundamentals, just to make the first couple months exciting where you're covering so much fundamentals. Um, I'll do a reverse tempo challenge on long tones. So you slow it down. Yeah, I mean, and, then, and just be like, how, and and you can you, you can do breathing challenges with that. Like, how long can you hold it? You know, yeah. with the with a good sound, number one, because they just go, ah, I did it, yeah. Um, but like, you know, reinforcing, how long can you hold it? How low can the BPM get? Like, can we can we can we do this at forty and everyone's still breathing the right way, kind right. of thing. That's um, good. Yeah. Yeah, just a, in a, one of those, like AJ said, those occasional treats, like Jamie said, you know. <laughs> AJ, you got anything about tone? Any questions? Devil's advocate. Tone is pointless. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I just think it's tone pointless. is a social construct. <laughs> deep state. I just like I identify as having a good tone. <laughs> tone is a tone, uh, tone is a tone, social construct. Oh god. I just think that it's one of those big things that are just completely hit or miss if you don't, if you're well, if you're not willing to you know, explore a few ideas that are maybe not, you know, uh, you know, that are not ordinary to you. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, it's just, you got to find what is, what is willing to work, what could work, 
And if it doesn't work, then you got to move on. You can't just do the same thing over and over again. So it's, you know, just doing the same long tones exercise. Yeah, that's great for consistency. But at the same time, you know, again, long tones are redundant. They're made to be redundant so that you can focus on one thing at a time, which is tone. Yep. Um, but they don't have to be redundant. You know, it's just like a, it's a fair mix between the two. So that's just, you know, like like I said, my little two bit earlier about the whole, you know, lo-fi long tones or whatever it is. You know, there's so many different resources out there to make long tones fun again. I would just argue that my approach is uh, the redundancy in the exercise is critical because the more boring the exercise is, the more you can focus on the concept itself. Yep. You know, you can take your mind off of playing the right notes and your your mind focuses on playing the right tone, they need a compelling teacher or instructor yep. to, to get them into that mode. Otherwise, yeah, they're gonna get bored. And that's that's the part that resonates with me of what you've said is it's not not just the compelling part of making sure your delivery is effective and interesting, but also it's the idea of stressing why it's important. Uh-huh. Kids kids will do it even though it's boring. If you stress why it matters and they see it, you know, because with long tones, you can also, we're going to talk about this with tuning too, you can get into the con- the conversation of overtones and having them listen for the overtones. And it's like, oh, wow, you know, and like, you know, and sneaking that in there, um, you know, doing you know, with the harmony director or tonal energy, playing that perfect fifth and then taking the fifth away and they can still hear it, that light up and they go, okay, yeah, that's the target. I'm doing that every day. And they, they, they know it sounds good and creating that buy-in through the defective teaching is what makes the boring worth it and as long as it's it's like you said as long as you see it's worth it they'll do it you know Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that's that's all it is and tone tone like you're saying aj it's super important um it's box one it's number one in box one if Mm -hmm, i remember correctly mm -hmm. uh we're talking about box one there's three boxes in our uh music performance assessment evaluations and box one is fundamentals and yep i'm pretty sure tone is number one numero uno baby several states is probably the first He's looking it up right now. Yeah, the first uh, criteria for evaluation. It was only a matter of time before he went to the FBA website. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like I, stuff. I I agree. Tone is number one, so that's the first thing you cover. Tone it's, quality. It's literally Tone quality. number one, box one. It is. Yep. The, yep, so that's the first thing. Just as a reminder. Upper left corner. Okay, and then after tone is timing. Is timing in box one? No, it goes tone quality, then intonation. So Time. we did touch on... Timing's box two. And then, oh, yeah. all right. So next is intonation, overtones. I mean, it's such a seamless conversation. And the thing, the weird thing about before we get to, too deep into that, the whole thing is that all of box one can be rehearsed at the same time, because in long tones yes. you can talk about intonation and you can get them in tune, and then with that you can talk about overtones and you can talk about resonance and you can. Um, you know, talking about the blend because if they're if they're into if they're if their tone is good, I forgot who told me this, but it's if their tone is good, then you're you're more you're likely to be in tune. And if you're likely yeah. to be in tune, it's easy to balance and blend. And if you're ba- if you're doing all of those things, that's what sonority is. Mm-hmm. Booga, booga. And then just make sure your physical physical articulation doesn't get in the way of that production. So if you're doing it's, they all lend each other to it. But like I mean, if we're talking about intonation. You, what are what are basic because they're oh my god this is an essay do we want to talk about <laughs> what we look for in intonation or do we want to start with how we teach intonation I, I how we teach I think this episode focus, focuses on how I teach it how you teach it how AJ teaches it and how we've seen other people teach it go for it okay um, for me intonation was always the the thing I struggled with the most for like the first three going into four years of teaching once I was able to watch Alex Kaminsky do it a lot not just with his own students but in my band room very very fortunate uh, to have been able to do that I kind of came up with this process that works for me and has been working really well the past few years so get them using enough air playing with a good tone then you know using down the row or around the band getting the kids to match tone to the student that sounds the best in that section. Um, then once, because they're playing with a good tone, you know you can safely adjust their instrument and they'll still play with a good tone. So what I mean by that is you don't want trumpets you know, pulled out two inches at the 
<laughs> at the tuning slide because love it. Love they it. can't learn to play with an open sound. So that was my go-to. I'm just kidding. I mean, <laughs> I've seen so many. I'm just kidding. Band directors that let their students do thing. that. It's a, know, they, it's a they, thing. They pull their instruments to these insane lengths and then mark it with a pencil. But they, I don't care about that. <laughs> but but I, no, I, but, I, I, but it's, part. it's it's the instead of breaking the bad habit of playing with a thin, close that, sound. Right. You know, so so I go that approach and then. That's when I go around tune indivi- each individual kid and show them on their tuners. You uh, you know, like this is your tuning note, and here's uh, where you want to set your instrument. Have them remember it from day to day where right. they set their instrument, so the tuning process goes faster. Um, and then we move into once once they're on that unison note, except concert C for horn, alto, and barry. Um, once they're in tune on that note very consistently, then we move to chords. Yep. Uh, and then that alone has a very good transfer into their music, especially if you practice intonation exercises at a sustain. You can pick any part in your music, turn it into a sustain, and tune it. Yep. And it, and it works really, really well. So that's what I do. I think, I forgot who this was. It might have been Marie Tallery, who's the band director at Watson B. Duncan, who's our age. She's... So quiet, but so dang good. I love Marie. She's awesome. If you're listening, yay. Um, hi. Congratulations on your engagement. Um, <laughs> she's cool. She bought a house too. Neat. Um, but like, uh, so her. I, I was talking to her about it because her bands have always been in tune. Uh, it's just a thing. She's just she's got that ear for it. And what else? I, I remember talking to her, and this was where it was around the same time in my career, it was year three, year two, year four, like in that window, mm-hmm. where it was just. If you talk about it, they'll listen for it. Just talk about it. What and through your teaching, you know, they, talking and talking about it means teaching them how to tune themselves. Talking a bit, talking about it, is talking about where tuning comes from. Making sure you're using good air and have a good sound so that you can tune. Talking about it is the plethora of different exercises you can have them do. Whether they're doing you're doing an F around the room, or you're doing F in sections, or you're doing just a full concert F. Just talking about it every day you know we have we have our tuning procedures where we'll, we'll do f around the room and i'll also do the ian i got this from ian schwint the mouthpiece checks you know oh very important so we do yes. we so we do pretty much everybody from like at least when the beginners are playing it's by by, by week three week four everybody is doing tone checks every day so we do a, and we and i get them in the routine where it it takes two minutes it takes less than two minutes to go around the room once on small instruments takes another two minutes to go around the room once on a con- on a concert F or whatever their best tuning note is. And sometimes and sometimes I change it. Sometimes the whole band's on a concert F around the room. Sometimes they're on their specific notes. Sometimes the flutes are on A, sometimes the flutes are on F. You know, sometimes I'll have the whole flutes tune A and that's it. The, the, you're, the, you know, we tune in sections on their different notes or we tune in sections on a concert F. Um, I do, I use so many, I try to do it enough, the same exercise long enough so that they can obviously improve at it. You know, sometimes, mm-hmm. sometimes that might be a quarter. Like I might have one tuning routine for the quarter, and then the tuning routine will slightly change for the next quarter, and slightly change for the next one. So by the end of it, we, they're, you're learning. You know, the kids are learning to tune in so many different ways that are all. But because they they're so similar, they see the similarities and the reason for it and the purposes for it, and that transfers into what you were talking about of being able to do that in the music. To, you know, mm-hmm. you dissect a piece, you dissect a part of the music, tune it, long tone it bop it, you know, do whatever you need to and focusing on that pitch. Um, but it's just talking about it. However you need to talk about it and however many ways you need to talk about it, you can get it. You know, we've gotten into the conversation of overtones and hearing it for this. We've gotten into the conversation of, of blending. We've gotten into the conversation of vertical alignment, which some people, some people agree with the concept of tuning down. Some people don't like I just throw it all at them, and we talk about it every. I talk about it once a day in some in some form or fashion, and we tune in some form or fashion once a day, so that way it's just always on their mind. And from there, in the past three four years, my the pitch of my band has gotten tremendously better because every kid knows it's just part of what we do. It all and on, sometimes I'm guilty of this. It comes before talking about tone, like I just I just I'm it. You know, the tone is like, it's a never ending journey. So is pitch, but I'll find myself talking about that pitch and fixing that pitch and fixing the, fixing the vowel shape, which fixes tone 
to, to craft the goal of pitch as opposed to crafting the goal of tone. Not, not that saying that that's the recommended way to do it, because sometimes I catch myself talking about it, because I talk about it so often. What about you, Jamie? I mean, AJ? <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of my tuning exercises stem from my experience in marching band, which, you know, it could be controversial. It's a different setting. Um, but the education that I received when I was doing that was very, very reliant on intonation and tone quality, which I'm very lucky for. Um, you know, having each section or the entire band, you know, we would do, you know, I'd hold out on the harmony director of whatever note, either F or B flat. Usually I did those two pitches. Um, and we would kind of go through a tuning sequence around the room and, you know, start off with two buzz, then uh, low brass, which we have, you know, I, I usually say that where we have trombones and euphoniums, uh, then, you know, going up the score order from that. Um, and we do, you know, usually start everyone on concert F uh, with horns on, uh, you know, their note, which is, I'm blanking right now. Is it concert C? Because we use concert C. Yeah, well, everyone... If you're on... The, then they're on their C. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So it's their G. That's concert C. Right. Yeah. 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 So okay. they're on that. So it has that kind of element where you can clearly hear what the horns are doing the entire time. But um, everyone will play that F, and then I'll look over to each section. You know, start off with the two buzz, and they'll go up to G, then A, then B flat. And they'll hold out B flat. Everyone else releases, and you look for that steady, that steady, you know, tone, that intonation, while the harmony director is going on. The ITC tuning sequence inside the circle. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Okay. Carolina yeah. Crown. Yeah. Well, yep. a lot of drum corps do that, and a lot of high school Maybe bands. Now, yeah. A lot of bands use it. I know <laughs> Palm Beach Central, the concert well, band yeah, uses the bands it. Bands do it now too. Marissa's yeah. band uses it. Um, they and she we. The first time running through that, the marching band was a doozy. <laughs> but so I, it I really only did that during my with my with my advanced group. And sure. I felt really comfortable doing. Obviously, you know, being my first year, I wanted to make sure that I could, you know, I can experiment it a little bit more. But mm -hmm. that's pretty much how it went. Yeah. So that's, that's I think that's I a good um, exercise. Oh yeah. No doubt, but yeah. the the it has to be preceded with the conversation of what happens to your pitch as you go up in register. And too many bands don't talk about that. So right? it just goes sharp. And so, yeah. It just goes sharp. Yeah, all their B flats sharp. are sharp. And yeah. I'm just. I tell all my kids just relax. You know, as obviously as you go up, especially for brass instruments, the tendency is you want to get obviously tense, you know, squeeze the note out. Mm -hmm. That's like, I feel like even I did it when I was in middle school, you know, just trying to get that note, you know, going up to the note, you know. Someone once told me, you know, you want to relax onto the note as opposed to mm -hmm. reach up for it. Mm -hmm. And so I tell them, you know, you're still moving up. You know, it may si it may seem like, you know, easy intervals to get up to, but you got to stay relaxed, especially with your upper body, your shoulders and your breathing. Stay relaxed. Keep the valve shape nice and open. Have the breathing tube air. You, you know, you, you incorporate all these things that we talked about before. You know, and we were talking about it. It's like I said before, it all leans into each other. If you're in tone, you're more likely you're more likely to be closer in tune. So, because all yeah, absolutely. Tone, the word tone is in intonation. Yeah, tone, tone and pitch are so closely related that you should, when you first teach it, break it down. But there's so like as you get rolling through the year, you can talk about both in tandem all the time, which then leads us into the next one, which I believe is balance. But let's is there any, are there any other before we get to balance? Are there any which I think blend should be before balance in my opinion. Um, doesn't matter. It's balance and blend is how people refer to it. The B, right. B and B. Um, but like, are there any other crazy? Are there any tuning gimmicks that you guys have seen, or anything weird that you've seen before that works? I mean, we can start with equipment. Yeah, that's built to make you play in tunes. You don't have to think about it anymore. That's a whole. That's all. Yo, we could have a whole other episode without. But I don't think I, we can't because we'll get sued. So there's equipment, and then. Nothing there's like, uh, blue trumpets or anything like that. There's uh, <laughs> no, I mean like maybe bleep that out. Careful, like, yeah. You know they're like you know, the perfect pitch center or mouthpiece perfect pitch center <laughs> and their trumpets perfect pitch center. There's, I play that, mouthpieces. But that that Kmart brand. Like I just buy one. Just I don't jamming know, out. I'm not a gearhead, but anyway. <laughs> um, so there's that, and I, you know, try to avoid if you can. 
doing the tuning for your band, like moving the instrument for them. That's hard. Telling yeah. them they're flat or sharp all the time. Like I can understand like you, if you've been practicing tuning all week and it's Friday and you want to hit the music, like yeah, you're sharp, you're flat, like or pull in, push out or whatever, right? Yeah. That that that's cool every now and then, but they you got to train them too. Here's a question: tuners or no tuners? Yeah, tuners. Yeah. Yes. Yes and no. You can use them. <laughs> you can. They're good to use. And then you can also train other ways. It and depends I think, on the situation. I think, I think you need to be trained. Some people are like, you got to train your eyes. The eyes help make it go by faster. And other people are like, but you can't use the eyes because you're listening with your ears. And I'm like, how about you use both your senses so that way you're good. You have Because two, two references gives you two different pieces of information that you can melt together to make a good sound. Hmm. I think it's a really good tool. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a really good tool that's comparable to training wheels, you know? It's good to go back to, you know, especially if you haven't been on, you know, obviously, you know, when you ride a bike and you never forget, but still, you know, you have Bet. the training wheels. <laughs> Bet, I've seen somebody, anyway. <laughs> you have the training wheels, you know, where you have it for a good amount of time or whenever you're practicing fundamentals, it's cool, um, you know, but it's good if you're just trying to check a couple of things. And I always think about it like, well, do I have a tuner on stage when I'm performing with me? No, odds are you're not. And, you know, you got to use, you got to be able to transfer the the ideas that you present with the tuner to intonation skills. Which comes from the ear. That's so, the fusion of both. So, yeah. So, you, so again, to your question, yes and no. Yeah. You know, you have to be able to have those those two ideas work together and be separate. I got a cool gimmick. Do you know, uh, it was, it was uh, Dr. Dunnigan is, show, show, is the first person to show me how to do it when he came down to do uh, Palm Beach's All County. Um, you guys know the, the, the app... Um, in tune, the in tune yeah. app, the game. Yeah, I love it. It's um, if you don't know it, it's uh, it's very, it's not available on Android. I don't think it is. Um, because I couldn't get it when I had an Android phone. But it's available on uh the App Store for uh iPhone, and it's a game where it'll play a pitch, and then you have to it'll play it. I think like once or twice. It'll play two pitches. Yeah, it'll play two pitches, and you have to um guess if the second note is. Sharp, flat, or, or in tune. tune, and as you get as you get better through the game, the 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 difference between the pitches gets closer and closer, and then you're getting within sense and sense and sense, and it's just a good way to learn. I I when I when I first teach pitch to beginners, we play it, and yeah. I'll play it every day for about a week or two, and then the kids will, and you'll have the kids playing it too. Another really good game you can play is harmonize. Yeah, I love harmonize where it has it's like the little Japanese dumpling, and you can you can train you can. It's two pitches going on simultaneously, or you can even just do one pitch. You can do it in octaves and in any interval, mm -hmm. and you just have to drag it. You drag the pitch to be as close to in tune as possible, and you can hear and you can train the kids to hear the waves disappearing, and you want to get within you know point point something sense. Um, my and I showed the kids that a couple times last year, and then I remember hearing seeing them in the hallways. Um, like waiting for class to start or like for other teachers and they'd be listening or like on the bus to field trips and they're playing harmonizing mm -hmm. each other mm -hmm. um, which be careful you're gonna play harmonize with headphones because it'll blow your ears out yeah <laughs> but it's but like those are two really good gimmicks to, to work with um yeah what what tuners do you recommend your kids use because i either tonal energy if they want to buy it or i recommend ins tuner um bandmate tuner is a good one sure um but really any free tuner is fine I think, but in, in our classroom, we have the kids get cork tuners right. and clip on mics. Uh, we, have actually, a we have a class set, so I use it for the top band. Not the clip on mic, but the cork tuner, because I'm working on getting funds for the clip on mics. <laughs> we, okay. bought, we bought the tuners last year. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the clip on mics help a lot, but I had a thought through all that talking. We were talking about getting the kids to play and tune on one pitch, but... Well, how do you teach them to play in tune on any note? Any ideas? So I, with that, because uh, that's hard to do, um, depending on what you're talking about. Not hard to do, but like, um, when it comes to playing soloist, like, because, you know, playing, playing as a soloist, am I in tune in general? But then typically, what do we, what do we deal with more often? We deal with ensemble playing. So right. I often... When we talk about you know playing in tune in general and being able to tune in in context, that's a matter of 
practicing and breaking down. You know, there's going to be there's always going to be moments in the music where those those moments are necessary, and those are the moments you break down and you can teach those skills. Um, also, doing basic unison to chord exercises. You know, and you can do unison to chord exercises and have them play the different notes because mm-hmm. not not all not all chords are written equally, so the tubas will not always be on the root. So you can all right, we're going to do unison to chord. And group one, you're gonna do this group, obviously, or group group, however many, depending on how many voices there are. But like you say, say you have three voices. Okay, group one, instead of playing the root today, you're gonna move to the third. And group group two, you're gonna play the root. And having them having to tune in those different contexts and exposing them to as many of those as you can through unison chord, through the context of the music, um, and then also tuning charts. <laughs> if, I was if gonna say that if you choose to go that way, and I. The way that we I did it in high school was we just had one tuning chart for the year. And I was just thinking about this. I was like, I was like, okay, when he's done talking, I'm going to say tuning chart. But then he said it. And I was like, you know what? What could probably work better than just a yearly tuning chart? It's probably a quarterly or, you know, half a semester for some of you guys. Marissa does semester ones. So you could do semester or quarterly tuning charts because, you know, these kids that we teach, we all teach middle school. They're changing, you know, their body is changing all the time. You know, sometimes, you know, you're, you're going to get a kid in sixth grade or whatever, and then within weeks, sometimes months, or even the year, or whatever it is, their entire sound changes, or they look different than how they were. Whatever. Okay, just, what, just what's doing, the purpose of a tuning chart? Just looking at tendencies. Okay, so so just, my question, though, goes beyond that. Once they know the tendency of their note, how do you, how do you teach them to play that note in tune? Talks about it's context of what you're playing with. Yeah, you have to th- you have to yeah. you have to look at your chart and so okay. So A on trumpet is naturally sharp, but it's an it's a it's a concert G major chord. So they have the root. How do you teach them to play the A in tune? You got that's my that's my question. Okay, so so you have to bring it from both. You have to bring it from both directions. You have to think about the chord tuning. Mm-hmm. But you also have to think about the personalized tuning of the kid mm-hmm. or whoever's playing. Mm-hmm. You have to have some kind of idea that marries the two concepts and says, okay, yes, your tendency is this on this note, but also, what is also true is the fact that you have to tune your note to this. So mm-hmm. you have to, you know, you have to get them to a point where it's like, you know, with anything that we do, we have to scaffold the idea yeah. and the concept where it's like, okay, yes, let's do a tuning chart. Yes, let's tune a chord correctly. And then once you get to a point, it doesn't quite go in two skyscraper directions. It kind of meets in the middle where you have to make a decision to have both ideas at the same time. And you got to ask the kid in almost in a challenging way, can you do this? Where you're asking them, can you understand the fact that you are, and it's kind of like higher level thinking, a higher level question. You can kind of show this to your administrators in some kind of way. But you can be like, can you understand the fact that you are tending to be this on this note but also trying to fit the chord tuning and can you find an area where it's you know generally there and realistically I, i'm probably overthinking this because whenever we would tune chords or anything like that in a piece i would always write in my music always write in my music down yep. or up yep that's what, what does that mean to you change your pitch i think that's what i'm trying to get at so that, hold on, like okay so what does that mean to me where i'm yeah. writing in my music yeah you need to play the note flat or you need to play it sharp? Yeah. How do you do that? You know? <laughs> you change your embouchure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or the speed of air or something yep. like that. Yeah, that's right. So we have to remember to teach that to our students too. That's right. So what I was getting at is, yeah, it's one thing to get your instrument in tune mm-hmm. you know, on your singular tuning note. But now we're moving on into music or into unison exercises now. Oh, now we're, we don't sound in tune on that note. Oh, trumpets, you sound sharp on that note. The first thing they're going to do is pull their slide up. No, 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 no. Stop, stop, stop. Yeah. Your, your instrument's in tune. It's you that needs to be in tune now. Here is how right. you do it. So yeah. if the... I forgot. I have a lot of good sayings because I hang out with old people. Um, one thing, and this was in college, someone told me is that if the tuning chart and the tuner are the, are the compass... And a compass works one, like a compass works a ty- it works a type of way, and there's a certain way to use your compass. And then the music is the C, where yes, you know, you, if you don't know how to use the tuning chart, and it's like yeah, it tells you what instruments or what note on your instrument is what tendency, 
but you also have to have the conversation of now that you know the tendency when you get to that when you get to that note in this part of music you're most likely going to have to change your embouchure in this way or x or y and it's getting them the 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 point of the tuning chart, the, the, the initial point is teaching them the tendency. The gold of the tuning chart is showing them what to do with that tendency and using that knowledge in real time when you hit those moments to make those changes with their changes in allow Right. And that's, I don't think... Yeah. yeah. I think that's it's, the gold. I, I don't ever tell my students to like in the middle of their... I don't think... It, you know, I, don't, I would like to say that no one does, <laughs> but I'm sure there might be someone mm -hmm. that goes, you know, pull out your tuning slide here on this note. Never. Right. Like, I, I know that you know it's kind of a thing, and I might you know if if I'm you know someone can call me BS on this, but it's kind of a thing with trombone. You can kind of adjust the whole things of giant tuning slide. Yep. But yeah, trombone you're supposed to right. Like and trombone is to think about intonation differently than other people. Right. And especially trombone band directors. And but with every other instrument, you have to use your embouchure. So I I understand. You know, that, that you have to do those things and I'm not you know there's no I don't think we have a differing idea here I think it's just no, it was just I like, was trying to get to right the that next step in teaching your band to play in tune it's not just getting their instrument in tune on one note yeah it's yeah. teaching them to to match pitch on any note yep so you have to teach those concepts each instrument has to do this to play a note sharp or this to play a note flat yep. without changing the length of the instrument except you know like the slides on trumpet and things like you that. you know once you've mastered the concept of learning your tendencies once you've mastered the concept of how to use a tuner once you've mastered the concept of how to tune via blend um and how to tune via via listening that's the penultimate and the final step is now that you know what pitch is now that you know what being out of tune is now that you know what being in tune is can you do both can you can you move can you move can you move the compass and can you move can you move with the ocean without being so rigid so i think that's the final that's the final piece is Doing, being in tune in real time. Maybe for you, yeah. I, not for me. It's the next. It's the next thing, and I. I don't do tuning charts, and I don't. I don't know if I will. Simply because, I think it's an. It's a step that isn't necessary, um, or I could teach it in real time. So like, if we get to a concert E flat chord, and I have trumpets playing F on top of the staff, I can go, Hey, trumpets. Just FYI, that note is naturally sharp, so you can pull out your 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 first off slide. And that'll bring it down. Check it with your tuner real quick, right? Yeah. Something like that. That's another way to reach the goal. I mean, it's, and it's as long as, it's one of those things where it's, you know, I think a lot of people who may want to use tuning charts, I've never done it myself. I've, all, I've always thought about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I've never, I've never actually done it. But I think the, a lot of it is people who use tuning charts is, in addition to having that in-time, real-time real teaching, it's just another way to scaffold and break it down and have a true understanding. And yeah. if you do it frequently, um, you know, one of the purposes of doing it frequently is just making sure it's hammered in your head. It took me it took me years to understand that E flat third concert concert D flat E flat fourth space is a naturally flat note on the trumpet. I didn't learn that till college, but maybe had I been in Marissa's band, where I was told that over time, you know, four times a year, I might have learned something. That's you know, you it's it's just one it's just another one of those things in the bank that you pull out in time in in context without even yeah. thinking about it. The thing about the tuning chart is it's assuming you're playing um, in the center of the instrument that too. at all times. That's too. So that's it comes. So that comes after everyone's playing. everyone's tuning chart is going to come out different, and then you're saying uh, doing it more than once. Yep. Your tendencies change. I think it's just better to know, you know, right now I'm flat or right now I'm sharp or right now I'm in tune and oh I'm sharp I need to lower my chin or I'm flat. I need to speed up my air. Just hone that instinct. Like, well, there's something we teach. Yeah. Just basic ear yeah. training. You know Did you pull that? up a tuning chart? I well, I searched <laughs> up. You can I also should... find the tendencies of instruments. Right, and I, that's that literally too. what I typed in. I typed yeah. in instrument pitch tendencies. I've known band directors to print that out and they just give it to the kids, and it's just a thing you have in your binder. And I think like like a, like a fingering chart. That's a great idea, but I and going off trying to do the two idea two concepts what you just said, both Christian and Andrew. I think it's a good idea for the advanced student when it gets to that point because mm -hmm. you don't want to confuse them too much with this. Oh yeah. Like, oh my god, I gotta think this. Thing. No, mm -hmm. like, get them to play. You know, have basic intonation, have basic, you know, understanding of okay, this is flat or sharp. Probably not basic, a little bit more, you know, intermediate understanding of that. Mm -hmm. And then maybe when you feel and this is this is based on you know 
your own prerogative of, of how the kid is doing in class, then you maybe hand out this sheet and be like, hey, this is this is a little bit more advanced. Yeah. But I, I think you're ready for I like that uh, step better. For understanding yeah. this tendency on your instrument. And obviously you want to make sure that the kid is playing on a nice, you know, decent instrument. Right. You don't want the kid to be playing, you know, on an instrument that, you know, they maybe did get on Amazon or something like that. Are you that, insulting my Kmart clarinet? Listen. Okay, the only, there's, the only a, s- there's a time and a place for Kmart instruments. And that is in the f- instruments. And that is to commit vandalism with. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say there's, yeah, a time and place for that, of course. Especially the more advanced you get, the more important it is to have a tendency chart of either, like, the pitch tendencies of all flutes or all clarinets or a personalized one, you know, to check in and see if you're, I, I, you know, I think doing the pitch tendency chart is a check-in to get towards like the the national pitch tendency chart of all trumpets you know i want to make all your notes are in tune except these yeah. few you An know acronym um, as, w- as with everything <laughs> the national That's pitch tendency example. of bank bank of america i would say that the only snag with this though is what was it, what was it oh yeah a kid will take one of these and then uh, uh you know very highly motivated kid will take a pitch tendency chart that they find online for their instrument, then take all their concert band music and start drawing arrows. Yeah. When yeah. maybe their personal tendency on C sharp on flute um, is flat, whereas on the on the chart here it says sharp. Well, maybe a good. Marriage. Or maybe they play it in tune naturally. I think the caveat. And now, yeah. now they're like, oh, I have to lower it, so they're gonna yeah. come to your band. They're gonna play it flat instead of playing. It I think tune. the caveat you know I mean? is that if you're gonna teach, if you the caveat is if you're gonna use a tuning tendency chart you need to teach with a lot of caveats and just <laughs> if you're if teaching to intonation cannot be a cannot be a a static concept it needs to be taught that intonation is a flexible concept um and if you're going to use it if you're going to use a pitch tendency chart to try to map out that flexibility you need to be mapping and thinking about it with flexibility otherwise yeah all those pitfalls come to play mm-hmm. and then it becomes a detriment without even realizing it i think with everything that a good amount of research and, and emphasizing a good amount of research not just a quick fix or a quick search like what we yeah. just did i i mean you know not to be disingenuous i just looked it up sure you know and it was there the first thing i clicked on mm-hmm. but under that Search is like ten other links to different pitch tendencies for each different. Check instrument. out my pitch tendency chart. Spon- <laughs> okay. Sponsor your body. Right. And so you I know, think you're gonna get paralysis by the analysis. That's, right. Uh, you know. Agreed. So so just keep it simple. And yeah. Agreed. Start with one note and then teach them how to play sharp or flat on a note whenever it, whenever the time comes and mm-hmm. and all, but always maintain a good tone. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I mean, we've spent so much time on. Tone quality, breathing, and intonation, which are the top three. I think we've, you know, it's been such a good conversation. Yeah. We've, this is, I think what we're, I think what we're discovering on our first true episode of season two is we have a theme video we can make. We can do, we can have, like, because instead of knocking out, I don't, I don't know, personally me, I don't know if I want to listen to 17 videos of only fundamental concepts with three idiots talking about the whole time. <laughs> so I think maybe what we could do is every couple, every couple of, you know, we could, this is a concept like the All Things series where it's All Things Saxophone, All Things Flute, All Things This. This is a series we could come back to. And we okay, can, sure. And we can dive into balance and blend and we can dive in and bend sonority and we can dive into physical articulation and then also like different types of articulation. I don't even know what physical articulation is. Oh yeah, man. I gotta um, see if I get good marks on that. On that one. <laughs> breathe, breathe, fa, <laughs> breathe, fa. But, uh, but yeah. So I think so. We're probably gonna call it here for now, but we'll definitely come back to this and we can through through episodes break down all of these concepts and talk about it and maybe you know bring in more people here, bring in some people here. But yeah. So this has been the beginning of season two. Uh, post the Andy Poor episodes, which if you haven't seen those, you by now you need to check them out. Yeah. But so this has been episode four or two episode something of season two uh my name is andrew <laughs> lopez we've got christian gordon aj arcia um thank you guys for listening and we'll see y'all later see ya see ya peace <laughs>